Now let's talk about a truly bizarre golden age superhero phenomenon. Teen sidekicks. Which, obviously, sidekicks that appear to be either teenaged or in some cases apparently preteen, pre-adolescent, like 11 or 12 years old. Well, the whole idea behind doing that, of course, was to introduce a character that the the targeted uh, readership, which were preteen and early teen uh, males, would uh, would would be um, able to identify with, you know, to insert this this character around their age into the story so that they could have um, both the perspective of feeling like they're trailing along with their favorite hero, but also uh, the feeling that they could even be uh, that, that hero. Well, um, this started with, uh, well, early on at the very beginning with Jimmy Olsen, the, uh, the, the young friend of, well, as, it, as the, uh, this comic uh, has it, Superman's pal, Jimmy Olsen. That was actually a spinoff of, of Superman that uh, lasted for probably a quarter of a century. Now, Jimmy Olsen doesn't fit the mold of what we're talking about exactly because you know, he's not a costumed superhero in his own right. He's the cub reporter who admires Superman, but, um, you know, isn't his official partner. Rather, he trails along behind him and gets in trouble, and Superman has to rescue him. Or, in this very disturbing cover, and believe me, there's a lot of very disturbing covers and stories uh, with all these with all these characters, um, sort of looking to Superman as a father figure. But this phenomenon really, really got started in the uh, in the mold that we're talking about in 1940 with the introduction of Robin, the Boy Wonder, um, who appeared in the uh, first issue of Batman's spinoff series, Batman, and who was uh, and this kind of becomes sort of the template is is an orphan who was uh, brought in by the hero. To, who, who then becomes their legal guardian. So Robin is the ward of Batman. That means he's not adopted, uh, in which case he would be the adopted son of Batman. Uh, so it doesn't quite go that far, but Bruce Wayne becomes his, his legal guardian. Uh, so it's kind of like this uh, nebulous sort of halfway uh, existence between just being a foundling and being an actual, you know, uh, official family member. So after Batman and Robin, then you've got a whole slew of these characters that uh, start showing up. Such as, for example, Green Arrow had Speedy. The Sandman had Sandy the Golden Boy. This is after the Sandman dumped his, I think, much cooler-looking gas mask outfit and looked more superhero-y. Aquaman had Aqualad, of course. And then uh, Captain America had Bucky, which really was changed around when Marvel uh, made the, uh, um, well, when they made the movie version of Captain America that we're all most familiar with in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. In the 2011 movie, Captain America the First Avenger, Bucky, alias James Buchanan Barnes, is not a 13-year-old orphan who is sort of unofficially adopted as the uh, mascot of Steve Rogers' regiment, thereby becoming eventually uh, Steve Rogers' sort of semi-official ward, as in the comics. Instead, instead, Bucky is Steve Rogers' childhood friend, who is at least the same age, maybe it's implied possibly even a little older, 
than Captain America, uh, the childhood friend who had protected Steve Rogers when they were younger from bullies. Okay, that's pretty interesting. We're going to come back to that. Oh, but for now, back to the 1940s. So Timely's other big star, the Human Torch, had a sidekick named Toro, who had the same powers as the Human Torch, even though the Human Torch was an android, an artificial being, and Toro was, was not. He was human. So that was, that was retroactively explained decades later by saying that Toro was a mutant, which... You know, uh, not a concept they had in the comics in uh, 1940, but one which later they figured out could uh, explain the unexplainable. In fact, in the summer of 1941, Simon and Kirby introduced the young allies with Bucky and Toro together with four other kids um, who don't have any superpowers or anything, not that Bucky does, uh, who sort of have uh, their own kind of semi-independent uh, uh, hero group, fighting Nazis and spies and saboteurs and what have you. Now, we'll be uh, coming back to them also, because uh, at least a couple of those other four characters were extremely problematic. Anyway, um, talking about sidekicks... Over at Fawcett Publications, Captain Marvel uh, had a whole family of teenage sidekicks, uh, starting with Mary Marvel and uh, uh, Captain Marvel Jr. Then later, there's, there's a bunch. We'll talk in more detail about them a little bit later on. Um, and this is kind of uh, this is kind of interesting because not only does Captain Marvel have more teenage sidekicks than any other hero, but as Billy Batson, he is actually kind of like his own teenaged sidekick as well. Over in Star Spangled Comics, you had a couple of uh, kind of uh, different things. You had uh, the Star Spangled Kid that we've talked about earlier and his sidekick Stripesy. This is kind of like an inversion of the norm in which the teenager is the hero and the grown-up is their sidekick. And then also appearing in Star Spangled Comics, The Guardian, uh, that we've talked about. And he had the Newsboy Legion. This also was created by Simon and Kirby. They did several things. They had Boy Commandos and uh, various other titles. Uh, they liked um, groups of, of adolescent uh, boys uh, working together. So anyway, you had all that. And let us not forget... The American Eagle and Eaglet. Well, okay, maybe we can forget them. Teen sidekicks kind of go out of style around the same time superheroes go out of style, which was the end of World War II. Although Batman continued uh, in production after that with, uh, with Robin on hand. Then teenage sidekicks kind of came back into vogue when superheroes came back into vogue in the late 50s in what is known as the Silver Age that started over at, at DC. Uh, and uh, a lot of those Golden Age, not all, but some of those Golden Age teenage sidekicks were brought back. And there were even some new ones like Kid Flash. And in 1967... Uh, sort of following the pattern set a quarter of a century earlier with the young allies, you got uh, teen sidekicks uh, coming together to form their own group, the Teen Titans. So DC was still into the teenage sidekicks in the 60s. Marvel, not as much so. In fact, when Stan Lee brought back Captain America, Stan Lee and Captain America co-creator Jack Kirby in Avengers number four. They brought him back without Bucky. In fact, in that, uh, in that first Silver Age appearance of, of Captain America, Bucky was killed off in a flashback. And it was revealed that the incident at the end of World War II that had caused Captain America to be frozen in ice had also killed Bucky. 
his teenage sidekick. And it was kind of uh, a well-established part of the character, the personality of Captain America from the 1960s for decades afterward, that he was haunted by the death of his teenage partner and had an incredible sense of remorse and guilt for having let Bucky down, but uh, sometimes actually having the comic book self-awareness to think that maybe it wasn't such a good idea to have like, you know, 13, 14, 15-year-old fighting Nazis to begin with. Which brings us to 2011 and Bucky at the movies in Captain America, the first Avenger, as stated earlier. Not introduced as 13 or 14 years old, but as a grown man. Now, Batman and Robin were, uh, they were Batman and Robin in the TV show of the 1960s that uh, you're probably familiar with. But when Batman returned to the big screen in 1989 in a darker, more modern take, which ironically was actually not so much a more modern take, but a more original take from how Batman was in 1939 before Robin showed up. Uh, anyway, 1989, Michael Keaton is Batman. There's no Robin in that movie. Nor was there a Robin in the movie after that, Batman Returns, or the movie after that, Batman Forever. It was not until 1997 and the fourth movie in that series, Batman and Robin, that Robin finally showed up. Uh, unfortunately, in what is generally considered the worst Batman movie ever made. But uh, even when Robin does show up, and by the way, he showed up then, and then hasn't shown up in any Batman movies since. Although in Batman vs. Superman, there was kind of an ominous shot of the Robin costume in a glass case, implying something bad may have happened. Anyway, even when Robin did show up in 1997, he's not 13 or 14 years old. He's clearly in his early 20s, just as, in fact, even back in the 1960s, uh, Robin as uh, played by Burt Ward in the TV show, was clearly in his early 20s. Now, why is that? Well, because it's freaking weird, that's why. For a grown man to be going around fighting criminals, uh, criminals and enemy combatants, and, you know, having a 13-year-old kid with them, uh, no matter how well-trained or lucky they might be. It's just kind of weird. It's kind of, uh, it's clearly very dangerous and irresponsible. Now, how could you become the legal guardian of, you know, 13 year old orphan if they found out you're going to be having them fighting the, the, the Joker's minions next week? It's also kind of weird in, in some, some other ways. And even by the late 1940s, people were starting to cast aspersions about uh, Batman and Robin, uh, Bruce Wayne uh, and Dick Grayson. And we'll be talking more about that later on. Um, and it seemed just kind of, you know, like I say, it just seemed a little too strange for Marvel, at least, uh, when, when they got back into the swing of things with the superheroes. And even, even for DC, after... After the 1960s, by the end of the 1960s, at which time, in 1969, Robin goes away to college, moves out. So Bruce Wayne has a, has a moment of empty nest syndrome, but pretty quickly gets, uh, gets back into the swing of things and returns to his... 1939, 1949 persona of being a dark and mysterious Avenger of the Night, with Robin showing up um, every once in a while in a backup feature uh, on his own with his college adventures. So Batman's that mysterious creature of the night throughout all of the 1970s and into the early 80s. <laughs> 
until he gets another robin. And then another one. And then another one. But we'll talk about that later. Now, don't get me wrong. Just because Marvel in the 1960s did not pick back up on the teenage sidekick thing does not mean that they had given up on irresponsibly endangering the lives of teenagers. No, because Spider-Man, uh, their most popular character, was uh, supposed to be a sophomore in high school when he uh, had his first appearance in Amazing Fantasies 15 and got an Amazing Fantasy 15 and got his, uh, got his spider power. So that means he was 15 years old. So by the time he got his own title, he would have been, I think he was supposed to be a junior in high school, so he's around 16. And the Human Torch, who is not the original Golden Age android Human Torch, it is Johnny Storm, uh, who is a member of the Fantastic Four, is supposed to be roughly around the same age as, as Spider-Man. In fact, they're, that's, that's why they're buddies, uh, kind of uh, bickering buddies, in the 1960s because they're both teenagers. We'll be talking more about Batman and Robin and Captain America and Bucky later on in the course, but for now I want to uh, take this opportunity, it seems like a good time, while we're discussing sort of the um, the vicarious nature of uh, readers following the adventures of these these stories and the fact that uh, we've just discussed a little bit about the uh, target audience of the comic books to take a closer look at how that came together and why and how it resulted in the phenomenon that was Superman. William Moulton Marston hit it right on the nose way back in 1940 in that Family Circle article he wrote when, uh, when he said that the popularity of Superman was not just, due, not just due to engaging stories, but that it was because the character had sort of tied into a sense of mythology that grabs people's minds, particularly young people. And if you know anything at all about Wonder Woman that, uh, that he created, uh, you'll know that there are very strong elements of Greek mythology in the Wonder Woman mythos, one of the Amazons from Themyscira Island and uh, the various different Greek goddesses play, uh, frequently play a role in her stories. This is also literally demonstrated in the Fawcett Publications Captain Marvel um, mythos. Remember, uh, remember Billy Batson, young Billy Batson, gets the power to turn into Captain Marvel from a mysterious wizard named Shazam. And uh, his name is a magic word. So when Billy Batson says the magic word, Shazam, he turns into the superhero. And Shazam stands for Solomon, as in the wisdom of Solomon, Hercules, strength of Hercules, uh, Atlas for stamina, Zeus for power, Achilles for courage, and Mercury for speed. And that sort of literal interpretation of the transference of mythology, uh, classical mythology, to a modern 20th century mythology is also uh, uh, reified, to use a uh, grad school word, by other figures from, from mythology that have become prominent in decades since. So in essence, there is a power fantasy at play here, wherein an audience made up of people who on an individual level feel powerless before the, the, the powerful forces of life that they must deal with each day, vicariously, uh, gain catharsis by vicariously experiencing power through imagining themselves, uh, through storytelling, to be these fantasy figures, fantasy figures that are uh, 
able to handle those vast powers because they are more than merely human. Which is essentially how mythologies developed throughout uh, all human cultures, right? Uh, by human beings being overwhelmed, frightened by things beyond their understanding, and making up stories about gods and demigods who could overpower the things that frightened them, whether it be tornadoes or ferocious animals or death itself. And which is also how young American men at the time of the market revolution slash first industrial revolution handled the, uh, the frightening social changes brought about by the industrial revolution by romanticizing powerful, larger than life, uh, rough and ready, uh, independent frontiersmen. And then later, during the second Industrial Revolution, doing the same thing again with dime novels and cowboys and gunfighters. In fact, I would argue that the superhero is the next evolutionary stage of the American mythology, the next step after uh, frontiersmen and cowboys, after, after Paul Bunyan and uh, Pecos Bill. And I would also argue that William Moulton Marston was on to something else from the beginning, and that is that girls read comic books too, and that girls look also for role models that are powerful and independent for the very same reasons. And unfortunately, it would take many, many decades for the industry to catch up with him on that. Frontiersmen with muskets, cowboys with six guns, superheroes with fists, or occasionally guns or swords or hammers or shields or batarangs. Uh, however you slice it, no pun intended, the empowering mythology is often a violent mythology, especially, uh, particularly in the United States, where sort of the American mythology was birthed in ideas of self-sufficiency and of conquest. I, uh, I recommend highly the works of Richard Slotkin, especially this book, Gunfighter Nation, to sort of uh, look at how that particular mythology was, uh, the American mythology, was, was formed in the, uh, in the early years. Or you could take my course on American Westward Expansion. Now bear in mind, Superman came on the scene in 1938 as sort of the culmination of several other things that had happened in a relatively short span of time, several other kinds of characters that had appeared in a relatively short span of time, from, uh, from pulp heroes to radio heroes to comic strip heroes, all of them finally sort of coming together as the superhero of comic books. Now, I, I argue that the timing of that is not a coincidence. I don't know how well you remember middle school, but let me remind you, it sucked. It sucked really bad, right? Because your body's going through all these weird changes, and there's also all these weird social changes going on around you, you know? Uh, middle school mean is a thing. That is the, uh, the age when kids start self-sorting into social groups, often based on class uh, and, or, and or race, depending on whether that's something that was already being enforced or not. So that's going on. Um, you're not a little kid, but you're not a grown-up either. And in fact, you're not even um, in high school which would put you considerably closer 
So I would say that on the average, right, it depends person to person on your circumstances and events that might happen, but on the average, middle school might well have been the most powerless you ever felt in your life. So bear that in mind, and then think about when these things started coming on the scene. They started coming on the scene in the early 1930s. So think back to middle school and how much it sucked, and imagine uh, that you were going through that at the same time as the Great Depression with 25% unemployment. And then on top of the Great Depression, everybody's talking about this guy. And, you know, uh, some, some people are kind of worried about it. In other words, 1938 was sort of a perfect storm for adolescent power fantasy to be hugely successful. And indeed it was. Now, I'm going to attempt to demonstrate further how that, uh, that power fantasy, that empowerment fantasy, if you will, how that works through um, a personal story about, about my own childhood. Now, I can't, uh, I can't put that in the context of the Great Depression because I'm not that old. But when I was a kid, we did have something almost as scary. Disco. Now this story takes place in March of 1978. When I was in the fourth grade, I was nine years old, nine and two thirds. Um, so there's me. And the other picture there are my uh, aunt and uncle, Edgar and Essie. Levenhart. Now, my aunt, that's my mom's sister, that uh, I was very, very close to my whole life. She, almost as close, almost as close as, as my mom. She was, uh, well, when I was real little, we all lived together. When I was nine, we lived right next door to each other. Uh, Edgar, who was, uh, uh, he had been married to my aunt uh, at this time for about, I think, six years, five or six years. He was, uh, he was a huge influence on me, fascinating guy. Um, he was a uh, refugee from the Holocaust. He was uh, Jewish uh, and from Czechoslovakia. When Hitler annexed Czechoslovakia in 1938, he and two of his brothers escaped. And like I said, he was a huge influence. He was very... Is very well educated, very sophisticated in a lot of ways. Spoke five languages, and um, envisioned things for me that, growing up poor in rural Appalachia, neither I nor any of my family would have envisioned. I mean, he used to say that I was going to be a professor one day, and um, he had a huge collection of history books that I used to love to read through uh, and various other things. I remember sometimes he would ask what I was reading. At one time in particular, I was reading Conan the Barbarian, and he explained to me historically what barbarians are, and he told me about the fall of Rome and stuff like that. So I, uh, I was very close to my Uncle Edgar. And on that day in March of 1978, when I came home, something was different. Now, Edgar had colon cancer, and he had been struggling for a while. And he was home. He 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 had not he had not progressed to the final stages. Uh, so I knew he was sick, uh, but he happened to die of a heart attack, and it, it was sudden. So anyway, I came home from school that day, got off the bus, and something was clearly different. Something was going on. And a friend of the family, my aunt's best friend, was there. And she, uh, she took me around behind the house and explained to me that, that my uncle had died of a heart attack. Well, 
I sort of very quietly walked away, went in the house past my mom and, and grieving relatives, and I went back to my room. And I went to my room, and I got out my, my plastic sword and shield, and all my stuffed animals and pillows. And suddenly, I was not a grief-stricken nine-year-old boy. I was Conan the Barbarian. And I was cutting my way, cutting a swath through my enemies, conquering them, uh, and coming out victorious against impossible odds. And I was going at them pretty hard, too. And my mom walked by, and she was kind of disturbed because she didn't think this was uh, normal behavior for someone who had just been told what I had been told. And my, my aunt's friend, I remember, told her, he's grieving in his way, which I was, right? Because I felt so incredibly powerless at that moment that the single most important thing in the world for me right then, in my mind, was to feel empowered and in control over something. So that's the, uh, that's the power of fantasy. And that's the power of comic books. On that day, 42 years ago, my loyal friends, Bert and Ernie, really took one for the team. And they still bear the scars of that and many other battles.